Okay, cool. Well, thank you everybody for taking some time out of your busy schedules to to uh, spend some time with us. Um, and recognizing it can be a little challenging to have a collaborative, you know, uh, conversation over the intertubes, we are going to do our best. So I thought I would just start off by introducing a little bit about me very quickly, and then uh, give you a quick sense of how I'd like to spend the rest of the time together. So, as you mentioned, Sean, I work uh, at Health Canada Results of Delivery, and um, my my unit supports the head of performance measurement at Health Canada, and so he's responsible for the implementation of the policy on results, which is sort of the bureaucratic slice of deliverology, the results of delivery piece. So uh, my particular responsibilities have been around the MC and TV submission process, program performance information profiles, and internal services. And uh, Health Canada, uh, until recently, was considered a large department. So um, had a budget of $4 billion, which has dropped off a little bit. Um, and we had a program inventory of 45 programs so that's my unit you know providing challenge oversight and capability on performance measurement 45 programs but now we're down to 33 which sounds better but has some challenges I'm a mid-career transfer to the public service so I bring a different um, flavor I think to to uh, the public service. I'm, I fully confess that I'm not a very good bureaucrat yet. It's only been eight years and I'm still a little, a little unseasoned, I believe somebody referred to performance measurement, planning and reporting. So I bring all of those capabilities. But I also have a background, an academic background in um, studying complex systems and how decision ma makers uh, perform in complex systems. So all of that background informs how I actually uh, have done the last two and a half years of implementation of policy on results. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, a number of issues uh, about what it means to do results in delivery in the public service. And um, I don't know if you can see, but on the back here, this is my bookshelf, some of my books. I have too many books. And obviously those bookshelves, those empty spaces will be filled up soon. But if you could see the books that were up there, these are the three books, there are three particular books that are capturing my attention on the policy on results file. There's factfulness, which is my hands rustling and is talking about the importance of data. And uh, there's the rise and fall of strategic planning by um, Henry Mintzberg, and that's my Canadian content contribution as well. And then there's the tyranny of metrics by Gary Mueller, which came out recently. And each of these books, uh, provides insight to some of the key challenges that I struggle with on this file, which really revolve around managerialism, so importing business concepts and practices into the public service and whether or not that's a good idea. The role of data and data center, because when we're doing results delivery, we're collecting data. Um, intersection between government priorities and then public service implementation of those government priorities. So how these, how the priorities sort of abut against bureaucratic processes. And particularly when it comes to performance measurement, uh, the distinction which Mueller goes into quite a bit, uh, the distinction between measuring to diagnose performance so you can course correct versus um, measuring to reward performance and what happens when the balance is off on those things. And then finally, accountability. Um, yeah, this one really keeps me up at night. Um, so I distinguish between accountability as being responsible for something 
uh, contra accountability as like my job is to count things, so to count activities or to count outputs. Um, and then how, if the balance is too far one way in terms of how we define accountability, um, what, have we, what have we done to ourselves in terms of professionals and not relying on our professional judgment as we're all trying to do results of delivery to benefit our constituents, whoever they may be. So that very quickly is meant to situate some of the things that keep me up, uh, that, that, that plague my conscience on this file. Um, but what I did to get ready for this talk, for this conversation rather, was I, I shared with my public service colleagues um, the apolitical blog post and uh, some of them had seen my medium posts as well so they've heard my other ruminations on it and I sort of gathered those uh, against questions that you participants had shared with a political and with Sean and so um, what I've done is, well, let me just go forward and I'll show you. What I've done is I've put the questions that came from, from Sean on your behalf on the left and responses that I've heard at various times from the Canadian Public Service on the right. And, and I've grouped them around a few uh, themes that kept recurring um, in this sort of asynchronous dialogue. And what I'd like to do is to just go through those topics with you guys and really um, let you guys bring forward the thoughts and observations that you want to share with each other. And I'll contribute, of course. Um, but I really don't want this to be a Jackie Tweedy spoke for 55 minutes and then we ask three questions at the end of it. So um, that's what I'd like. We have about I think six or seven themes, so not every theme I think will get the same amount of time. And not everybody I think had a chance to see the themes beforehand, um, but uh, you will be able to see them soon. So in my last minute, this is what I'll say for now. Uh, a few questions were directed specifically to me and my answers are here on the screen for you. Um, I don't think that two and a half years is enough time to say success or failure, but I'm not sure that failure, I don't think we were failing before, so I don't think the results of delivery um, in the last two and a half years would, would have, would have um, given us success. I mean, I, okay, basically I'm not sure that it's, uh, a, completely formed question. The challenges, we have a lot of challenges and we're going to discuss some of them. They're in the themes that come up. Um, but my, my biggest concern is that we're so busy doing that we haven't stopped to look around, to look around at what we've done in the past within our sectors, within our public services, but we also haven't had a chance to look horizontally with our colleagues and collaborators. So with that, and I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss further at your leisure, but here's the first theme that came up. So um, at this point, I wanna turn it over to the floor to, to, uh, to weigh in on what I've said so far and on humans as decision makers. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Catherine, I know you had shared a few different references in uh, the group message. Could you, do you want to start us off? Uh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot. Yep, thanks, Jackie. I, no, no problem. So, uh, this is the, the, First topic, the humans as decision makers. This is really the um, the key point, isn't it? And I, I've been struggling myself in the work that I've been doing, I am, which is as an academic, uh, temporarily spending a year with a government agency as a policy fellow, 
I'm struggling with this question of how do we get past the um, the confirmation bias I am, that that we're looking for, and, and I know we we all do it. So we're looking for evidence, but we often tend to dismiss the evidence that contradicts a, a bit of an initial frame. What's what's your thought on that? It's, a, it's an enormous question, but but what's your thought around? Are there specific I am best practices that you've seen? I, I know there are specific questions that you had um, outlined, I think, in your in your blog post. But how, how do we push on that aspect? Gosh, um, way to throw it right back at me, Catherine. <laughs> so um, I think that uh, I think that some of the some of the steps that we've seen from. Um, recent government initiatives in Canada might help us deal, tackle in part the confirmation bias issue, which goes to the, like how you frame the evidence and how do you interpret, hmm, how do you interpret the data points that you get based out, based out of how you set up your evidence gathering framework. And, and that's by the transparency and openness um, initiatives. So if I go to GC Infobase, can I see the fully specified methodology? So can I see all the definitions to understand uh, what's in and what's out about what's counted? And if I can see the frequencies and I can see the trend over time data, um, you know, I think these are all things that push us away from the biases and the potential for gaming of evidence towards a uh, a more neutral space, but uh, you know uh, that it's highly dependent. I think, and I don't. Think that it's highly dependent on um, not only political factors, but also whether or not uh, the the legislative and regulatory framework is set up so that so that those practices are enduring. But I would really like to hear from from other people on this too. Anybody? I mean, that's my off the cuff. It's a big one. Marietta, I don't know if you had any thoughts. I know that you had the question, but perhaps you have some thoughts on this. Uh, no, <laughs> not really on, on this topic. What was the topic that you were interested in? Uh, my question was more like uh, what uh, has been uh, considered a success for Canada implementing the results and delivery initiative and what are the challenges we still need to address? Right. So, so I know, I know there's, there's, uh, um, any number of Canadians in, in the room, in the virtual room right now. And, and um, I know that a lot of you had a lot of things to say on this topic. I just summed them up, but I think there's a pretty clear sense about what some of the challenges are. Um, putting it out to the room. Hi, uh, Randy Legault here. Um, I, I've uh, watched a number of initiatives over the years, and the joke is, you know, I'm still stepping around the chalk lines from the last one that came along. Uh, but uh, w one of the big challenges is cynicism. People look at uh, these initiatives and say, well, yeah, that's this, this year's model of whatever it is, and, and we'll just uh, play the game and go along, and we'll be doing something different next year instead of buying in to it as a, as a valuable uh, change. That's, that's one of the challenges that, that any government has rolling out a new initiative internally. So I think to, to overcome that, you have to show some results that matter to people. And, and uh, I've been going back uh, throughout my career, even evaluation generally, uh, managers are always uh, resentful of anything that takes them away from what they think is the important use of their time. 
which is uh, serving their clients or saving the world or making the world a better place. Uh, but uh, like adding up the numbers for the evaluators always seems you, know, you often get uh, pushback that it's just a waste of time. So, so it's the how do you how do you sell it? Like how do you sell these things as more than just the flavor of the month and a waste of time for the cynics in the room? You know, and and I think. Uh, uh, or some would say less even cynics, maybe pragmatists that say, well, okay, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do this, but uh, pragmatically, it's not going to make a huge difference. So for those of you who are actually working in results and delivery shops, how many of you people feel welcome in a room when you show up to a meeting? Well, I'm, this is Catherine Turner here. This is my first call, so I'm reluctant to step in something you guys have already talked about, but uh, I'm one of those pragmatic program delivery manager type folks at this point in my life. Uh, in the past, I've been in community uh, exercises. I was a community director of a community university research alliance. So mm -hmm. I've seen um, collaboration around uh, work that is dedicated to trying to determine what the best results will be and to achieve those in a variety of different venues now from community now moving into government. And if I had to say what the difference was uh, between the two and what the challenge is within government is that um, it's almost the silo, the silo piece. I don't think anybody intentionally is siloed, but yeah. the reality is that success looks differently depending on where you're situated within, within the world and within the context. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's resistance, for sure, because people are trying to juggle different mandates and processes and figuring out how they all fit together to achieve what, um, that accountability in both directions because that's really where we sit it's not just accountability in one direction it's up down and across basically but at the same time I think part of it is that um, re meaningful results really do look differently depending on your starting point I mean I've had experiences in community um, situations for example, I think I, I provided one when I sent an email recently to the uh, back because I, uh, when we were working together, we had medical practitioners working with housing support providers because we were working in the field of mental health and homelessness. And they started applying a tool. They trained jointly together at the same time in the same room to apply the tool. And what they saw as the, the correct interpretation of the results that they had took them in totally different directions. One thought it was positive and one thought it was negative. Mm -hmm. So I keep coming back to, to the thought that it, it really isn't possible to have this, co this conversation without um, good relationships and a good level of collaboration. And um, the challenge with that is that's time consuming. It assumes that people stay in the same positions for a period of time so you can develop those relationships. And uh, it means that you can um, test what people are saying by, by introducing the questions that challenge their assumptions on both sides. And uh, so I'll be quiet now, but that's my feedback on the practical, the practical piece or the cynicism piece. Right. Hi, it's uh, Richard Ramet here. Um, I'm um, one of my experiences, at least in the past, and I don't think it's changed very much, is that in some cases we're viewed as um, like people that are doing results and delivery are kind of viewed as auditors to a degree, and uh, that we have the potential to really influence funding going forward. And so in some of these cases, uh, where people are, are uh, on the like you know if your results are neutral or perceived as negative um, the, the the whole funding envelope question comes to mind and then people are, are a little more 
um, I would say, conservative on what they want to say uh, in terms of the results because they're really afraid that the next funding, next budget cycle is going to be harmful to them, that, that they're not able to demonstrate in any clear way what the value added of the program is. Um, whereas other people just want to so really, one of the barriers is the, the, the different uses for the results and delivery information, right? Some of it is, is really about telling the story. Other people see it as the accountability to Canadians and the, or to whoever. Um, so it's really, um, I think we have a marketing problem <laughs> in terms of, uh, well, true, I mean, um, it's like when we were doing the draft or the, the reductions back in the day. Every I was part of the, the team that was uh, that was actually figuring out what those reductions would be, and it was based on on performance information for many cases. Um, right. And when I'd be walking down on the floor, I was going to talk to people about uh, you know what changes need to be made. Uh, I literally could hear the Darth Vader music uh, playing in the background because I was. Uh, I was the bearer of bad news, and I think that's the kind of stigma uh, that results in delivery is kind of getting internally anyways. So I see that as a pretty big challenge. Yes. Thanks. And I wanted to add that the challenges with in facing it's mainly coming up with the best indicators that will measure properly the advancement that uh, we have achieved. And for this reason, uh, I have asked the question about what is considered a success. Well, if I can, if I can come back to Catherine's comment, like it, it really, it really is shaped by where you're sitting, right? I mean, I, I've, I've spent the last, um, two and a half years um, working with programs trying to um, yes it's part of the challenge and oversight function but also s sort of a, a, a substantive conversation about why the program exists the program the program performance story shouldn't really be about telling me about the success of the program and doing the things that it's supposed to do, which is what a lot of programs, in fact, end up measuring. The program success story really ought to be how well it's delivering um, services to people in Canada. Um, but moving, oh, moving towards that performance story, um, involves different processes, including that collaboration um, in, in measuring what matters. Um, and that's, that's a, a hard, I, I have found it a very hard sell, like to come back to Richard's comment about the marketing problem. Um, I have found it a very hard sell because the program, yeah, in some ways is going, well, look, this is, this. Whatever I put down in terms of a performance story may or may not have an impact on uh, program renewal. I completely agree, Richard. Again, here I'm and it kind of puts us in a bit of a of a situation where we could be saying something about the performance, and then an evaluation group will come in and evaluate the program based on the performance information that we've collected, and come to a completely different conclusion. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to happen very often, but in the cases that it does, well, it basically, um, and not intentionally, but it, it undermines the entire purpose of, of uh, the results and, and delivery of the performance reporting that we do, because it basically shows that we either are biased internally, uh, or it tells, uh, that it tells people, or people will interpret it as Saying, well, these guys are trying to tell the story they want from the data that they get, uh, but that's not necessarily the only story you can tell from that data, right? So again, coming back to that comment about depends where you sit, yeah. uh, could be positive or negative. I think that's a real challenge as well. I wanted to recognize Joanna. Yeah. Make sure to uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Joanna? 
you should be uh, all set to speak. Uh, in that case, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go to Debbie. Debbie, are you? Can you, can you yeah. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, I can. So, so what my question was uh, back to the group actually is, is uh, whether what we're discussing are even symptoms of a deeper challenge that affects this um, result in delivery, but a lot of other parts, which is the government culture um, and people's uh, discomfort with uh, sh being willing to show less than optimal results, um, even though that's one of the best ways of learning. Well, uh, for those of you who aren't on video, I, I just gave a, a thumbs up to, to the comment. Um, I think uh, you know one of one of my degrees is in linguistics, and I always I always uh, want to want to um, flag when we need to uh, use terms really carefully um, because for me and and uh, for me there's a distinction to be made between government and that's why I, I think PCO and PMO and their priorities and the bureaucracy and and they don't have the same drivers and they don't have the same cultures. And even within the bureaucracy, within the public service, for me, there are two very different, okay, like there's a jillion cultures within any one organization in, in the bureaucracy. But I think that uh, there are two fundamentally different uh, rules of engagement within any organization. And those are the senior management rules of engagement. And then there's the what's below the, the the DG waterline, right? And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean that they have very different drivers. And so we have all, all these competing tensions. And I know certainly that, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, the comment is often made that the culture needs to change. Uh, the culture of the organization, the culture of government, the culture of the public service needs to change. But, um, but, uh, I, I think to say that it's a culture issue, again, also misses the deeper systemic uh, um, issues that are at play around this file. It's, this is a complex system with complex issues and complex drivers and, and, and turning towards any one solution is, is probably not gonna get us where we need to go. If Rob Shepard's on the line, I'd love to hear his thoughts. but I'd like to hear anybody else's thoughts too. I know that Wendy, you have your hand raised. Are you able to speak? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. I'm, I'm assuming you can. Um, they, they say it's not paranoia if they are out to get you. And so the fact that that program those responsible for program uh, reporting and, and uh, statistical or otherwise may act paranoid, uh, may be a reflection of the fact that there is accountability uh, in parliament and, and publicly, and that not everybody that's receiving these reports is um, inclined to take them as neutral statements of fact. Like, where is the dog that carries the stick used to beat it, right? Um, and so, so uh, while so, you know the, so you get a lot of. My sense is you get a a, a lot of uh, preference, if you like, in reporting to be able to spin the story. So so that which seems a little paranoid until you take that other aspect into account. And when you, the more um, you move to objective uh, results based reporting, the less spinning is possible. And I think that's a source of, of resistance that you find in the culture. I mean, all of this in, in Canada, and I'll, I'll post something to the chat, um, that, you know, uh, it, it specifically goes back to Parliament 
that's reviewed the results reporting saying that they're garbage, that we can't tell what you're doing with our money and we need to find a better way. And, and so, so these tensions permeate the system, uh, you know, in a way that that is not insignificant. I mean, that's, that's my observation. Uh, anybody else? Hi, it's Joanna, finally. Um, <laughs> sorry, technical difficulties. Um, but uh, I, I had a point actually about process. And I feel that at least in the Canadian context, um, sometimes the, the whole mechanism of the performance measurement and the setting targets and all that, it just, by the time it filters down to the program level, it's so distorted from, or, or by the time it filters up to the senior deputy minister level or whatever, um, there's, there's, because, the, because the, the bureaucracy is so large, um, there's a disconnect. And even in terms of the timeliness, like that we get requests from TBS to have performance information or to set targets or information, and there's not enough time to do our due diligence and to do it, do it the right way. A vigorous head nodding over here, sir. Other comments from the room? So my, my last tweet before getting myself set up for this was about process. Um, so many processes work against us here. And, um, you know, um, for those that are not in the Canadian public service, this, this will give you a little, this story will give you a little bit of insight. Um, but it, it took, it, within my department, it took the better part of six months to come up with the GC InfoBase indicator per program. So one indicator per program. And that wasn't because people weren't on task. They were on task. It's at the levels of approval, the processes within branches were such that, and then within corporate were such that, that it, it took six months, right? Um, but um, within my department, I, I don't have direct access to the programs. That's that's an aspect of the cultural norms of my organization. So even if I wanted to provide the best advice that I could about this performance indicator and not that performance indicator, I have to go through a whole series of processes in order to make direct contact with that program. And it, within my organizational culture, and it is different for every department in the public service in Canada, at the federal level, um, how the results and delivery units are set up is very different. So for instance, I only do performance measurement. I have to, and I'm happy to, but it creates more churn and more time on process. I need to collaborate with my evaluation partners who are in a different part of the organization, with my data strategy people who are elsewhere in the organization, with my chief results and delivery office who are again in a separate part, and with my gender health unit guys who are over there. So it's actually five minds that need to come together on any one program or any one treasury board submission when we're trying to um, provide guidance as well as fulfill oversight functions on the results and delivery file. So um, it's, it's, it's important not to underestimate the complexity of, of what we're trying to do against some of these very real sort of perverse incentives that make people want to continue to behave this way around performance measurement and not that way. Um, I know other departments are organized differently um, so that all of the results and delivery functions are actually within the same organizational unit. Uh, maybe 
hopefully some of you guys are on the line and can speak to what it's like for, for you. But for me, I often feel like I'm one fifth of a hive mind that has to, <laughs> you know, find a common ground. Jackie, I wanted to bring in one question that was asked from um, someone in advance from the UK. Um, and I think it relates yeah. to the Joanna's question, which was, uh, yeah. Is delivery really a science? Which aspects can be standardized and how does it impact the relationship between the center of government and line ministries? I would say the short answer is no and yes. Um, it's not a science because because we, we're, we're just not that de well developed in terms of our evidence gathering practices. Um, we have a lot of data cleaning to do <laughs> in government in terms of our performance measurement. Uh, and until that data gathering, data cleaning is stable, it's gonna be very hard for us to say, okay, we've got indicators that hold true over time on the results and delivery file. Other aspects of government, yes, scientific, it, best scientific practices are at play, you know, and I think here about regulatory activities uh, as a for instance. Um, it, but it is, it has aspects of the scientific method to it in, and, and has had them over time. Where we keep falling down is we keep changing what we're measuring whether it's new government or, or a new manager who wants to gather information on this indicator, not that indicator, or we didn't get the resources that we needed to continue gathering this data, so now we're no longer con collecting it. You know, these, there's, um, we do know how to gather evidence, we just don't always have the resources that we need, you know. I think it might be more accurate to say that we try and use the scientific method and we try and use it consistently. Um, but um, if, and, and if that's enough to meet the test of whether or not it's a science, then okay. But it's, but it's not physics, right? And I think one of the problems with performance measurement, in fact, is that it suffers a little bit from what I call physics envy. It always wants to have a qualitative, non-subjective, completely objective, measurable, discrete data point. Well, that's, that's not public policy intervention. It just isn't. Um, and actually that's not what physics is either. But, uh, but, I, but I think we chase the metric and we miss the science. And I really would, I can't recommend highly enough, and I don't get any money or anything, I have no relationship with Jerry Muller, but he really does a much better job of, of, of saying what's wrong with scientism and managerialism and the pursuit of the metric in uh, delivering um, public policy interventions for, 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 for people. I hope that helps. That helps. Thanks, Jackie. Does anyone else? I don't know, Randy, if you had a thought based on the comment you just posted. What I what I posted was uh, the report from uh, one of the um, Senate committees uh, on government operations, OGO, in 2012, and uh, and that that uh, is the impetus that and the parliamentary budget officers. Uh, challenge in Canada to um, the government of the day by starting to actually pick apart the reports to Parliament and, and come up with with data and try to make it a little more uh, a little less storytelling a little more scientific if you like uh, so so uh, um, th that's all I was posting was to, to give people kind of context for that but that's a very influential report and continues to uh, to have an effect on how we do uh, government in Canada today, uh, the current debates around this year's budget, for instance, uh, have, have roots in, uh, in that report. So that's uh, context.
Thank you. And Ed, I know that you had, you shared something. Are you able to uh, unmute yourself and just kind of share your uh, question out loud? Yeah, I think so. Are you, are, uh, are you hearing me? Yes. Yep. Well, my whole point was I've, I've just, I've worked in a whole series of different countries. My interest has always been innovation and all these kinds of new management approaches. But the one thing that I keep seeing in Canada is just this inability to communicate. Um, where is the official public sector innovation website, the blogs that give you tools? the management newsletters, ma um, magazines, all those things that go to communicating and distilling messages that they sort of cascade down. I've been quite stumped that, to, to try to understand why Canada doesn't really do that because it seems to me that would underpin a lot of these issues that people don't know what's going on. But that's, I think, by design. So if we don't get the results, it's hard to blame staff who have no idea what this Paul, what this program is or what that program is. So I, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty aware of um, hooked up, joined in. I don't know. I'm pretty aware of what the innovation guys are doing uh, federally um, in Canada. Um, so PCO has an innovation hub. They have an impact and innovation unit they have um if you if i think they have an ngc collab if not ngc Co connects but they're really pushing for experimentation and they're featuring and doing case studies of the experimentation work that goes on and you know sidebar that's like pursuing the random randomized controlled trials in in public policy intervention which is interesting um and all the behavioral economics stuff so it's it's there uh, um, a fair amount of it is internal um, there's um, a certain amount of it that is public and and certainly their presence in the Twitter sphere is notable it's it's yeah and um, what's interesting uh, for me uh, since I uh, straddle a number of worlds because I also straddle the AI and data science world in the public service is there is a disconnect. There's a huge disconnect between the impact and innovation unit um, at PCU with the results and delivery boots on the ground on the public service, like the bureaucratic side of it. There's really not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of communication between the two units. Um, and I and I, I I don't say that in a judgy way, just a statement of fact, and that and that may come out of the different priorities behind the work. Um, you can certainly see the PCO tracker, which is um, a, about the deliverology slice of things. But um, uh, we also do have the Canadian Digital Services, which really kind of holds um, or maybe has the most public visibility in terms of um, the, the public service side of innovation, but it's really about uh, government services in uh, digital delivery, uh, in the digital delivery realm. So again, there's a bit of a disconnect, like they're really, they're really not kind of uh, necessarily focused on innovation in terms of program service delivery redesign stuff I, i'm not sure why that is but that's kind of how it's cashed out in canada anybody um else want to comment on that that's my particular take right i'm not uh, not quoting from any book on that observations from the field can i just anybody else? back here for a second yeah the, um, i guess my point is that the government the public sector is too big not to have a much more dedicated, focused communication channel. Um, think of the Mandarin in Australia, or the Australians, there's a public sector one, or a Canadian version that's like a, a political, the whole thing that there's just too many themes, too much content that managers need. And I'm just cannot understand why at some level, 
they haven't thought of this as in this day and age of actually creating high quality, interesting, here's your daily public sector management, you know, tip, blog, you know, like, like a real communication focus on management and staffing. I would have just thought that would be natural in this day and age. So that's my two cents. Observations from others? I don't know if uh, Joanna or Marietta, uh, do you have any thoughts? Or Ibrahim? And you haven't gotten to speak yet. Ibrahim? Yes, yes. No, no, no question. Yeah. I mean, I will, I will, uh, I will say that one of the, um, one of the things that still surprises me two and a half years into the policy on results uh, coming into effect is um, the, the, the number of times that, that I find myself um, communicating to people that there is this, this new policy. It replaces the old policy. There has been this shift. There are these new uh, open data sources about Government of Canada performance information. Um, and that is not meant as a criticism of line managers. The line managers are at capacity in terms of doing their day-to-day -day work. Um, so so if, it's, if it's not, if they are not given the time to become innovative, <laughs> they will not become innovative because their time is fully booked on all of these other tasks. And a lot of the reason why their time is fully booked on all of these other tasks is because the bureaucratic processes are overly burdensome, repetitive, deadening, um, taking away autonomy for them to just make a decision to move a file forward. They don't have, they don't have the extra capacity, the extra bandwidth to go to, to stop and take a breath and look around and, and say what's going on and is am I doing what I do in the best and most meaningful way possible you know um, and I, I, I say that I say that recognizing that in the Canadian Federal Public Service the people who have the most time for the innovation file are the people for whom that is their day job that is their nine to five day job to work on the innovation file. Almost everybody else is doing it corner of the desk work. And I don't think that that is a sustainable model if you want to redesign the public service for the 21st century. Muted. Do I need to stop talking? Oh no, you're, you're good. It's, it's Catherine. Could I jump, jump in on that point? So Absolutely. What, what is the business case as, uh, as an example, as somebody is trying to move that point forward that you've just made, that point of, of encouraging, I, I guess, more positions, I, making more positions available I, for which the, the sole purpose of the position is advancing innovation or focusing on something that uh, full-time so so how do you I, I agree that that's the issue and I keep asking the hard questions but how do you set out that business case to actually put this into place well I you know when I figure it out I mean I'm not perfect <laughs> no understand like you're so, you're right. Every department is supposed to be putting aside 5% of its budget on experimentation, right? Can anybody from the departments currently listening, can they say, I know what our 5% on experimentation and innovation is being spent on? I'll guess at the answer, and the answer is no. And yet, every deputy minister is going to report to the center, we have spent 5% of our budget on these experimentation initiatives. I don't it's Debbie know here. The answer. Yeah. 
um, my experience in the last, in the last few years as well, actually since the the new uh, policy was that unfortunately um, people go look to what they're already doing that fits the criteria to call experimentation um, because nobody wants to take on anything new. And, and so they're not, it doesn't end up to be very broadly understood that there's, you know, a particular intent of doing something in a different way to, to meet that uh, objective that was assigned to, to all the uh, uh, And Jackie, perhaps that's a good uh, segue and I mean, I know I'm conscious of time. And so what I'd like to do over the last few minutes is just to uh, kind of go around and understand, given the discussions that you're already having in Canada and elsewhere, um, where are the ideal next steps? Where do you think apolitical can support this work uh, in what you're doing? Jackie, I don't know if you'd like to start and address the last question as well. I'd actually like to hear from people and uh, just just because, I mean, I have my own thoughts and I'm very happy to make those thoughts public, but I'd like to hear from, from other people. How can a political support and what was the last question? Uh, I, I think it's just how, how can uh, what are the next steps in terms of how would you like to see yeah. political support uh, the work that you're doing? Yeah. Okay, so I, I would like to hear from other people first. I think sharing of resources, sorry, this is Joanna, um, sharing of resources and tools and information and um, learn, lessons learned is always uh, appreciated, um, particularly uh, the lessons learned part. Yeah. And um, is that currently something that you do in, the, in your GC collab group? So I don't know that we've, um, I've only posted in the policy community on this particular topic. Um, I think there's more of this resource sharing happening in GC Connects, which is internal to the Government of Canada. Um, there, that doesn't mean that the resources can't move over to GC Colab. Certainly, um, certainly we've we've done that there but i think that i'm not sure who uh, raised it earlier but there is a dearth of information about how this is working in and has worked in the uk and i don't think the lessons learned from the uk have been disseminated widely enough yet because there's a lot to learn from that um, and i think that there are a lot of lessons from the us to take on board and from Australia and from New Zealand and from Japan and from South Africa. And, uh, you know, so, so I, I could see a role there for a political and or in collaboration with something like GC Collabs, which is open to partners outside of the Canadian public service. Um, but yeah, I think as, as Joanna said, it's not reinventing the wheel. So sharing knowledge, tools, processes, and case studies uh, are invaluable um, and scientific. They do meet the test of the scientific method, do case studies. Yeah. Randy, is that your hand raised for this? No, <laughs> no, it wasn't. I was looking for for the 5% innovation uh, source, we'll probably be able to source that back to the group later. Um, yeah. The question was, sorry, because I've been doing my research here. Um, How, uh, what can a political offer to, to push this forward? Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I think the communications piece and the awareness, the public awareness piece is, uh, as noted, uh, not particularly well done in Canada, and you can speculate why that might be. I think we've, uh, you know, we've had a, a digital doldrums in Canada that 
coincidentally or not, uh, aligns with the creation of a shared services organization for all digital um, uh, infrastructure in Canada that's uh, slowed us down for a little bit as that got up and running. Um, I know there have been some tr some efforts to uh, get better internet sources uh, out there. Uh, so I think, um, you know, increasing awareness and, and uh, uh, you, you know, leveraging uh, more sophisticated uh, um, digital platforms, social media, uh, you know, um, and maybe taking what uh, clues there are in the in the uh, uh, you know in in the environment and magnifying them. You know, if, if, if the government of Canada isn't actually getting that those messages out there loudly, maybe a, a political can offer a bit of a bullhorn uh, for it. Uh, I'm not sure. But those are just some thoughts. Mm -hmm. I I have a final thought I'd like to share, if if that would be appropriate, Sean. Go ahead, finish us off. Yeah. So I I want to recognize that we had more questions than answers, and and um, and I hope that you have a chance to look at the questions, and we can continue this conversation. But I want to um, I want to leave with the thought of like we aren't failing at being public servants and we aren't failing as public services no matter where we are if we were failing we would be seeing failed program and service delivery to our citizens on a wide scale we're not failing and i think it's important to hold on to that and we are innovative in so many millions of different ways, incrementally and below the waterline and not publicly. We succeed because people are receiving what they need from their governments. Um, so so if, if this is about chipping away at things around the edges to do a better job of communicating that and, and of sharing how we arrived at the performance story, I'm, I'm totally down with that um, and I'm totally down with us making as part of that conversation uh, the central piece being what government does is different from what business does and you can't judge us by the same standards that would that would be the final thing I would say well, thank you, Jackie, and thank you, every, everyone, for joining. It's about 1 p.m. Eastern time, right on schedule, and uh, we just want to thank you for spending your lunch or evening with us, um, or in some cases, probably early morning. Um, and uh, yeah, Jackie, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thanks. It's been great. Thank you so much, everybody who joined in. Bye for now.